Welcome to Saturday Night with me, Papa Kwesi Endo. This is the program we call Ghana Great and Strong. It's a unique public interest program. No politics, no insults. Our aim is to make sure that we help develop Ghana and Ghana becomes a great and strong nation and all of its people prosperous. That is our objective. That is what we want to do. Tonight, we will discuss the public sector reform program, the pay reform program, and the single spine salary scheme. This is important. It is important um, because some people don't quite get this, that if we do not get the public sector right, the private sector will not work. Some people make the mistake in thinking that the private sector is the engine of growth, so they ignore the private sector. But by ignoring the private sector, the engine will stand idle, rust, and perhaps collapse. There cannot be a private sector without the public sector. And you know, the Ghanaian private sector in particular needs a productive, supportive public sector. The private sector needs a public sector that is productive, a private sector, a public sector that is encouraging, a public sector that is efficient, and definitely, definitely, it needs a public sector that gives it unique advantages, special advantages, so that our Ghanaian industries, our Ghanaian businesses can produce, can sell, can do well, can make market right here, right here in Ghana, and be competitive. That is what we're looking for, and that is what we need. And that is the reason why public sector reform is an important part of what we need to do. It's an important part of the changes that we need to make this country great and strong and its people prosperous. Now, when the private sector needs licenses, permits, infrastructure, educational facilities, and so on and so forth, who is sup supposed to provide them? It is the public sector that is to provide infrastructure, that is to provide the roads, the bridges, the airports, and so on and so forth that is needed. It comes from the public sector. If you want to, to start a bank, you need someone in the public sector to give you the license. If you've got millions and millions of dollars and you want to come to the shores or the land of Ghana to drill for oil, you need someone in the public sector to give you the permit. If you want to prospect for gold, it is the public sector that needs to give you the license. If you want to do any kind of mining, diamond, manganese, bauxite, any of those things, you need, you need somebody in the public sector. If you want to register a company, whether you're from Ghana, from America, from the UK, France, Italy, wherever it is, you need somebody from the public sector to give you what is required before you can start, before you can get into business, before you can earn one peswa. So the public sector is important and we ignore it at our own peril. And that is the reason why Ghana has not been working as efficiently as we need to. And that is why I want to take some time today 
I want to take some time to explain. Go back a bit, give you some recent history. So part of what we will go through tonight is a bit about history, but we will also come a bit more to the present. And I will take my time to go through some of the material that is there because you need to know. You need to know some of this stuff, maybe you have heard somewhere before, but many have not put it in the context that I am going to put it in tonight so that we understand each other, so that when you hear certain things being said, you know where it comes from, but also you know why it is important. And so I'm starting with point number one. And point number one is that the public sector is necessary. It is important, but we must make it work efficiently, productively, in order for that public sector to do what the private sector needs. So if Ghana is going to work, if Ghana is going to be a great nation, then it needs a great public sector. Indeed, when you go to many countries, let me take France, for example. The French have a public sector university or public sector school. The people who go to that school, they are not those who couldn't get into some university or some college somewhere. They are good people, well-qualified people. It is those people that come into the French public sector. So good people going into an elite institution then come to the public sector in France and they produce something good for their people. In the same way, you have people that go to schools of government and so on and so forth in many universities in the US those people come out of those universities, they enter the American public sector at the local, at the county, at the state, at the federal levels, and they deliver something good for their people. Here in Ghana, well, everybody does what they want. We, we get the people somehow. And many of our good young people, when they get out of college, university, or whatever, well, many of them, they want to go into the private sector. They want to work for a bank. Some of them say, I want to work for a multinational company. A number of them, they want to work for some good private sector organization. And so the public sector becomes the employer of last choice. The employer of last choice. And so the dignity that is supposed to be there in the public sector is not there. And if the dignity is not there, if the people don't feel good about what they're doing, if they don't have what is needed to be done, the end result is also not going to be good. Well, Ghana, great and strong, that's what we're going to discuss today. We're coming to you not just through a number of television stations, but we're also coming to you through about 20 radio stations all over Ghana, all the 10 regions of Ghana, on the World Wide Web through Hejole, online radio.com, in the UK through Ahumka Radio UK, and in many, many other parts of the world. So Ghana Great and Strong is sponsored by the Ghana Growth Fund, the people who are quietly building industry, supporting the private sector, but also helping build infrastructure, bridges, roads, and so on and so forth throughout Ghana. The Ghana Growth Fund Company is our major sponsor to Ghana Great and strong where this evening we are discussing public sector reform, pay reform, and single spine salary scheme. Well, let's get to it. 
if you want to participate in this program tonight, no phone calls. We're not going to take any phone calls tonight, but you can send us your messages through WhatsApp, and our WhatsApp line is 020-751-6185. The number again is 020-751-6185. And our topic, once again, is public sector reform, pay reform, and the single spine salary scheme. Now, I have put it in that order. I have put it in that order because many people just talk about the single spine salary scheme. Well, single spine didn't just get up from somewhere and arrive on the scene by itself. A single spine is only one component of what we call the pay reform program. So I will explain that to you. But the pay reform program is only one component of the public sector reform program. So that's how it works. You have a public sector reform program, you have a pay reform program, and then you get a single spine salary scheme. And even the single spine salary scheme was supposed to be implemented in stages, in stages, we're only at stage one, and it seems like we're stuck there. But it is supposed to be impl implemented in stages. And it is important for everybody to understand and put this in the right context. And let me say to you, I became public sector reform minister in 2005. And I didn't go there easily. I also somehow didn't get there as willingly as I might have gone somewhere else. Because, you know, at the end of the 2004 election, I had become the Member of Parliament for Commander Edna Iguafu Abrim. And I had an, reached an agreement with President Kufu at that time, that, okay, I had served in his administration uh, during the first term, and that was enough. It was okay. He will go and work with his people. I will go and serve my people in parliament. And we said goodbye to each other, and that was it. And then I got some inquiries from certain people. Most importantly, I got some inquiries from some of our development partners. And some of their interests was in sitting down with me to help me understand what the country needed to go through. That there are a whole bunch of things that were supposed to be done in Ghana. And especially as part of the HIPIC program as part of the improving our finances and so on and so forth, there was one area that was left untouched. There was one area that needed attention, but no attention was being paid. And that was the area of public sector reform. And a number of them wondered, should I be offer offered a position to deal with that? Would it be of some interest to me? Now, having served in government before, I knew that if you talked public sector, all sorts of problems immediately occur. One is financing. Who is going to fund a public sector reform ministry? But most importantly, a public sector reform ministry is a relatively technical ministry. It's a technical, it's a, it's a consulting job. You're going to go and take a look at the public sector and help bring improvements. And change is not easily accepted. So it's a technical job. So if we're going to do a consulting job, who is going to pay for the consulting services? Who will pay for the people that would have to come from the private sector, from the public sector, to help determine what needed to be changed? And so some of them... Some of them, not gov Ghana government, mind you, some of them, development partners said, if you go there, we will provide some funding. And if you have the right program, we will support it. 
But I also needed the word of the President of the Republic, which was John Ajikun Kufo, who also then said, yes, this is a program I believe in. And so we will create this new ministry. And if you're interested, then you go there. So I had, I had put down my ministry or minister hat that I was going home. I was going to rest. I was going to be a member of parliament. But because this was supposed to be another key to open up some other possibilities for the country, I took that opportunity. And so I became public sector reform ministry. And we went to work. We went to work to try and figure out what is it that needed to be done so that we could make the public sector something exciting, something different, and so on and so forth. And so what did we do? We took a look at all the studies, all the work that had been done before, because I come from a background as a management consultant, and I didn't want to go over ground that had already been covered before. I didn't want to get to the end of my stay in the ministry, and then all that I would have delivered would be another report. Another report that would say, these are the problems, um, these are some recommendations, and then leave it for someone else to come and, and deal with it. So instead of writing another report with findings and recommendations, we came up with a comprehensive public sector reform program. A program that was taken to cabinet and which was approved by cabinet and it was launched. And the program, had a good, uh, we had a good uh, a, a program to launch this so that everybody would know that a public sector reform program had been brought into being. And we went to work aggressively to get this thing implemented. So let me go over what the public sector reform um, was all about so that you would understand and you would know what was included in the public sector reform program. Now, what I want you to know, and I, I'm, I'm showing a, a document, this document that I have put marks on here and there. Uh, this document, we, we prepared it in a very fine way. Uh, got it all printed nicely, and it became something that you could put somewhere and refer to it every now and then. And this, this program, this, this thing that became a book, small, neatly prepared book, became the public sector reform program that we keep referring to. Now, let me go through the components of what was in the public sector reform program. Now, You know, for about two decades, prior to 2005, a number of public sector reform programs had been put there, or had been started. But these have, had been largely technical teams, project teams sitting somewhere, without the power, without the backing of someone sitting at cabinet as a minister to push the programs. So when in 2005, May, May of 2005, the Ministry of Public Sector Reform was created, it became a necessary part of what government at that time said it, it wanted to do. Human capital development, private sector development, and good governance. And so it was there and established to revitalize the efforts of reform. And so the public sector ministry was to become the institutional home for all public sector reform projects in government, in the public sector, and was to be responsible for monitoring and evaluating the progress of reforms across the public sector. And so what were the objectives? One objective was the delivery of efficient and cost-effective public services to improve the living conditions of the poor. Number two, create a conducive climate to make public 
organizations more responsive, more responsive, and to build capacity and enhance efficiency in the machinery of government to provide timely and productive services all over. And so here were the things that were there. There were 11 items under the public sector reform program. Let me go through them. And remember, the, the, the text and the WhatsApp number is 020-751-6185. 020-751-6185. Let me make, make sure that I got that right. 020-751-6185. So 11 items, 11 items, number one, was to refocus the mandate and the structure of the civil service. Number two, to come up with service delivery improvement. Number three, to deal with records management, the storage and retrieval of information. And number four, work, deal with something we call the conditions of work. I'll explain one or two of these quickly. Number five was public sector pay and pension reform. Number six was to restructure central management and strategic management agencies. And number seven was subvented agencies reform. Number eight was public financial management. Number nine was decentralization. Number 10 was information, communication, and technology. And number 11 was development, communication, enhancement program. So there were 11 items in the public sector reform program. Now, let me just mention two or three or four of these, and then we'll go into the pay reform program, and we'll talk about that one in more detail. When I talk about the re refocus the mandate, and structure of the civil service. Um, you know, before the ministry came, if some of you will remember, if you met a chief director, every chief director that you met was acting. Every one of them was acting. So we came up with a program to make sure that chief directors, for example, that they would have an educational program and that those who were deemed competent will be confirmed so they would have security of tenure and so that they will do their work. This was done. This was done. And we also made sure that at GIMPA, that GIMPA became the institutional home for the public service once again. So if you go to GIMPA today, you will see that some new programs have been brought into place and enhanced to ensure that GIMPA would train, would give um, a lot more um, education, and so on and so forth to people from the public sector. There was this thing we call conditions of work. Now, I, 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 we coined that, that word, that, those words, conditions of work. What is conditions of work? It had to do with the environment that we work in. So that, for example, when I went to the ministry, the Public Sector Reform Ministry was, was, was uh, cited where uh, the Public Service Commission is, those of you who know Accra. And when I went there, I'll be sitting up in my office, and every now and then, I will see something and I'll, I would think that I'm seeing, maybe I'm dreaming. You might see someone carrying a goat, and they're not just carrying a goat for carrying a goat's sake. They are selling the goat. You might see some people with cloth, just like you see them in a the market, and with some cloth on their heads. They are selling cloth in the ministries. You see people carrying all sorts of things, selling them. Some people selling bread, walking up and down the stairs in the ministries. So we said, oh, no, 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 no. What sort of condition of work is this? And then if you came to the ministries, you saw little kiosks all over the place. We removed all of them. We removed them. I had a lot of headache doing it, but we removed them. And we started even putting walls. And if you, if you go there today, where the Public Service Commission, you'll see that the wall is still there. Um, we walled it, we cleaned it up, and then we started to see 
about cleaning, putting barriers around so cars and taxis couldn't come into the ministries. Now, every now and then I will get a note from the office of the president. Now, the president says, this thing that you are doing here, it's making our government unpopular, so it should be stopped. So I'll read it and I'll say, oh, is that so? Take it to whoever brought it to me that I know who the president is. If the president doesn't want me to remove the lotto kiosks, if the president doesn't want me to stop those selling goats at the ministries, he will call me himself and he will tell me to stop. Anytime I said that, the letters wouldn't come back. So we continued and we did our work and we cleaned up the place. Now, you ask me, so what happened? Well, you know that I came out of that ministry and then they downgraded it. They downgraded it. And then the late President Mills also came. And he closed the ministry and made it a desk or something at the presidency. So many people don't even know that even today there is some minister sitting somewhere at the presidency and some secretariat there that is supposed to be responsible for public sector reform. Well, it won't happen. It won't happen that way with a weak institution that is supposed to do something that many people don't want to do. Don't want to do. That's how come you don't hear public sector reform any longer. And we also, for subvented agencies, what is a subvented agency? GBC is a, is a subvented agency. GNA is a subvented agency. There are a number of other ones like that. Well, some people have forgotten. But indeed, there is a subvented agencies law that we made sure was passed to help strengthen those agencies, give certain ones independence, and so on and so forth. It's there, but it's lying there somewhere, not being worked. And in the area of ICT, we also started the process of bringing in, um, you know, <laughs> we even had the, 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 the biometric clocks where you would go in with, with your thumb or finger and you clock in. You clock in and it was started at the accountant general's office. I won't tell you the story behind that one. Um, and when it was done, they found out that they had more people than they had thought. Because if you didn't clock in, then the whole idea was that that day that you didn't clock in, you'll be deducted a day's pay. And no one could clock in for you because it's based on biometric considerations. We also then started the process that we're going to put CCTV cameras at the ports, at the airport, and so on and so forth, so that what you do, what you do at these ports of entry would not be a private matter, but a public matter, so that we can help increase revenue, increase productivity, and so on and so forth. Well, you might want to ask me what happened to those things when the ministry was closed. Obviously, those things went away. So the public sector reform program is made out of 11 components. And all of those components, we had some competent people, competent teams that had started working on. But the one element of it that everybody was interested in was the pay reform one. So we're going to take a little break, but we'll come back and then we're going to talk about the pay reform program. Uh, but before I do that, um, there are some, some messages that um, uh, we have received and I just want to go over some of them for me. Well, there's someone who just says, hello, I'm listening from Mankesim. Well, thank you for listening uh, in Mankesim. And um, they, there is someone else, um, uh, Kofi, he says, Teacher Kofi from Abrodunko. Uh, Teacher Kofi says, Dr. Indo, with all this in-depth knowledge that you have, what is preventing the NDC government from coming to you for, for help? This is all in the name of politics. Ghanaians are fortunate to have you. That is from Teacher Kofi, uh, who sent that from Abra Dunko. Now, 
there's someone who is also insisting on calling. And I want that individual or whoever is trying to call me to know that the, na the number I gave is only for text messages, for WhatsApp messages. Um, well, um, the, the, um, I have uh, someone else, he didn't mention what his name is, says, what was the reason for the establishment of the single spine salary structure? Well, I'll be coming to that one um, when we come back from, from break. Uh, Kofi Mensah from Mori says, I'll be glad if Dr. Indom could tell us if the single spine salary structure policy is being implemented as, as planned, is being implemented as planned, and what percentage of Ghana's tax revenue is actually being used to fund the policy. If not being implemented as planned, what needs to change? Well, we'll get to that point. Uh, another one just says, I send my greetings uh, to all Ghanaians. And he says, this is Kwabna Amwatin from Germany. And uh, Kwabna says, NDC should have sought your ideas about the single spine salary. Uh, there's another person, um, he doesn't give us his name. He just says, good explanation. And Abraham from Winch, he says, Good program by all standards. Why don't you replicate this on other TV and radio stations? <laughs> this one uh, makes me smile. Sungumo from Sungumo Dauda from Sefi Drabusu says, Doctor, when is your debate with President Mahama coming on? I want to see how you will lecture him on governance. Well, Sugumo Dauda, I am also waiting. I'm looking for a promoter. Um, there are all sorts of people promoting all sorts of award shows, entertainment award shows, TV award shows, all manner of other shows and programs. I just need one, one person or one group, one team, one company that will say, I will promote this debate one-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball. One brain to another brain. The brain of Papa Kwesindom competing with the ideas coming from the brain of John Dramani Mahama, my friend John. I'm still waiting for the debate. So, so if you are waiting for it, I, I am also waiting for it. Um, Gideon from uh, Abre Maguna, uh, he says, oh, the WhatsApp number, he's correcting me in terms of what WhatsApp number. Well, Thank you very much. The, 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 the number, yes, is 020-751-6185. Um, so thank you from Abrim Aguna. Um, Bismarck from Brekum is just saying hello. He just wants me to know that he is also uh, listening. Um, Yamusa, I'm not sure I understand his message, but... Um, Pakondia from Abra, Abra Asunji says, uh, Good evening, Doctor. What necessitated the closure of the ministry? You know, Pakondia, I don't know. I don't know. And I've, I've often thought about this. I don't know whether they wanted to reduce the number of ministries or just what. But it started, it didn't start with the NDC administration. When I left the ministry, it was downgraded. And then, it, and, then, and then when the NDC administration led by Professor Mills came, they just also then cut it out completely. It's an unfortunate thing. It's an unfortunate thing because, you know, the former senior minister, Mr. J.H. Mesa, he introduced a paper to cabinet, the cabinet led by President Kufo, to create a Ministry of Public Service and Administration, which when I came, I also uh, reviewed the paper, made some changes, and reintroduced it. And I still believe it in it today, that it is very necessary to have a high profile, a very strong ministry for public service and administration in Ghana. And we will need it for several years because we need many reforms many changes. You can't ask the Ministry of Finance to lead reform. 
You can't ask the Ministry of Energy to lead reforms. You can't ask the presidency to lead reforms. You need a ministry that will ensure that these kinds of things, the reform program. I, I'm showing you another document. This, I went through my archives, and here is a document. This is what started it all. This is the memorandum to cabinet. That's the form that it takes. It's a memorandum to cabinet that I took. I took to cabinet from the public sector reform ministry. And the date is October 9th, 2006. October 9th, 2006. This is what was taken to cabinet. Now, what was this that was taken to cabinet? Let's, let's get into it. It was asking cabinet to provide input and assist in formulating a new comprehensive pay policy and solution. And it went through the history, the recent year history, because you see, since the mid-1960s, Ghana had been looking for what was called the Sustainable National Incomes Policy. But then the latest, at that time, from 2006, the latest policy and the most comprehensive one that had been implemented at that time was what was implemented in 1997 when a consultant, Price Waterhouse and Associates, was contracted and they designed what became known as the Ghana Universal Salary Structure, GUSS. And this framework was based on job evaluations across the civil and the public sector. And so a new 22-level salary structure was introduced based on grading and classification exercise that was done at that time with the support and assistance, technical assistance of Price Waterhouse Associates. And the intention the intention, I'm, and I'm, I'm taking my time to go through this, because obviously we're not going to finish this today. So part two of this will come next week, Saturday. So I'm just introducing the pay reform to you, and I'm giving you the history, and it's important to understand where we have come from. So the GUSS, the original intent was that all ministries, agencies, public sector employees, state functionaries, and indeed everybody paid from the consolidated fund would be governed by this GUSS. That was the intent. But however, during the implementation, it was decided that the new system should be introduced in phases, beginning with members of what was called the consultative forum at that time. And who were these people? The Ghana National Association of Teachers, Civil Servants Association, Ghana Registered Nurses Association, and the, and the Judicial Service Staff Association of Ghana. Now, unfortunately, this has not turned out to be the case. That is that not everybody paid on the consolidated fund was governed by the GUSS. And so, for all those years, for the seven years that the GUS, GUSS was operating, up until the time when this paper was pr presented to cabinet, we had different salary structures within the public services. So that 22 level salary structure, GUSS, which was approved to be implemented, it ended up being bastardized, bastardized and indeed different structures were in place. And there are difficulties encountered. There are difficulties encountered because attention was not paid to supply and demand issues. So I explained all of these things. And you see, there were staff groups, staff groups that had negotiation rights, negotiation rights and I'm not going to mention some of these groups because what, what, what was done for these special groups created animosity 
on the part of others. So if you take some people out of the agreed scheme and you give them some special consideration, then somebody else sitting there saying, ah, why? I am a secretary, she is a secretary there, uh, I get 10,000, she gets 20,000, it's not fair. So all these disparities and distortions came about. Indeed, indeed, there were some people, some people also who were being paid through the consolidated fund that were not even known to the Ministry of Finance or the Controller Accountant General. So the point we were saying was that the GUSS had become something unworkable. And indeed, at the time that we were doing this, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, the Polytechnic Teachers Association of Ghana, POTAC, the Ghana Medical Association, GMA, Metro bus drivers and, cons and, and conductors, and so many of them uh, were engaged or threatening industrial action. And so this was an idea that came in order to come up with a holistic, comprehensive service classification and, and pay program. Now, the policy also that was initiated, the GUSS, could not be implemented in full because of financial and some other constraints. And you see, let me, in, in November 2005, when the budget statement was read for 2006, something was put in there that many people have forgotten. And I will give you those three things. Number one, said that we were going to consolidate all cash allowances, monetize and consolidate, consolidate such benefits as fuel, house staff, driver, and utilities, that is telephone, water, electricity. Number two, monetize and consolidate all benefits such as vehicles. And number three, monetize and consolidate benefits such as housing over a three to five year period. I don't know if you understood what I just said. That November 2005, if you go back and read the budget statement, then it promised that we're going to have a three phase program that was going to do these things over a three to five year period. Consolidate all cash allowances, monetize and consolidate bene uh, all benefits such as vehicles, monetize and consolidate benefits such as housing. Well, obviously that hasn't happened. So indeed this paper talked about the history of what we had gone through and then it talked about what the work that had been done so far. And it also said that a steering committee had been put together involving the Public Services Commission, Public Sector Reform Ministry, Ministry of Manpower, Youth and Employment, Ghana Employers Association, TUC, Office of the Head of Civil Service, Civil Servants Association, and the Ministry of Finance. And so a pay reform tax, task team had been developed, had been developed. And so the pay reform policy that we were seeking approval from cabinet to begin working on for implementation. What we said was that government should move away from yearly negotiations to three to five yearly negotiations. And then all stakeholders should be included to serve on the pay administration body. And that job evaluations within service classifications should, should be developed to provide internal consistencies and that while a new pay structure is being considered, it is important to note that as part of the public sector reform program, there should also be an activity to determine the right size of all ministries, departments, and agencies. And so we sought the approval to start and begin the pay reform program. And this was October 9, 2006.
So this is what started. We got the approval to get the pay reform program started. So teams were put together. People were brought on board. People from all over the public sector got involved. And that is how the program got started. And um, as the program got started, a number of other things also were put in place. Now, I said cabinet gave approval for pay reform program to begin. The last piece that I will go through, this was October 9th, 2006. But then right after that one, right after that one, we took another paper, this one, uh, the late Kojo Redu and myself, took another paper to cabinet. And this paper was looking for the approval, the approval to bring into being the Fair Wages Commission. What we call the Fair Wages Commission. Now it's become Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Okay. It's jointly presented by the Minister of Finance at that time, the late Kujoba Redu, and myself. Now, what we were asking was that we establish this commission to be responsible for pay administration for the public sector in Ghana. And we were looking for the responsibility to work with the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General uh, and to have a drafting team to put this commission together. And you see, why did we put this thing together? Because when the Ghana Universal Salary Scheme was put together, there was no body, not a body or institution put in place to do the administration of that policy. There was no secretariat. And so if there were any issues to do with implementation and so on and so forth, whenever someone was unhappy, well, they got attention and something was done for them. So this time we said, let us put one body, one institution in place. Let them be responsible for negotiation. Let them be the ones to do the interpretation of what should happen, what should not happen. So that was what was meant um, for the establishment or with the establishment of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. What were they to do? To ensure fair, transparent, and systematic implementation of government's pay policy. To advise government, make sure that decisions implemented on all matters to do with salaries, grading, classification, conditions of service, job evaluation, all of that, that it was all done in one house and to manage and coordinate all negotiations where compensation is financed from the consolidated fund. Now, let me, let me say that again, because it has relevance to today. Because it also became part of the law, because this was not only approved by cabinet, but we took it to parliament and for a law to be passed to bring into being the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. This third bullet here in our paper is important. It said to manage and coordinate all negotiations where compensation is financed from the consolidated fund. Let me ask you, the negotiations are supposed to be happening between the Ghana Medical Association and government. Who is coordinating it? Who is managing it? Is it the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission? Absolutely not. Why is that not the case? Why is it that there are some government ministers handling it? Where is the Wages and Salaries Commission in this? That was the role that was supposed to be given to it so that politics will go out of it because this is more or less a technical matter. So wh wh how does politics come in? Why is there a Minister of Employment and so on and so forth involved in this? Why are politicians involved in it to make this become another political matter? Um, and the commission would also have sole legal responsibility and authority to perform a number of other functions. Pay structure within the public service, um, mechanisms for pay systems to attract and retain critical people, uh, and so on and so forth. Co 
coordinate, manage, and monitor all collective bargaining agreements in which the government is employer directly or indirectly. So this, this is how the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission came into being through this paper. Now, what I want to go to next, that will have to wait for next Saturday because I will now be getting directly into single spine. I've just given you the history, how this whole thing started. And I've tried to put it in the proper context to you, that the single spine salary scheme didn't come on its own. It is only a component of the comprehensive pay reform program, which was supposed to be implemented in phases. Ultimately, it was to lead to the consolidation of all benefits, including even the payment of utilities, telephone, electricity, and all of that for government or public sector employees, even housing, transportation. So single spine salary scheme was only one component, and we seem to be stuck there. And then it's a component of pay reform. And pay reform itself is a component of the 11-item public sector reform program. One important component of that 11-item program was to lead to productivity increases. It was to lead to bring in ICT, ICT products and services to the disposal of the public sector. I, I, I will never forget, as we went around the country trying to determine what was happening, we went to the Cape Coast Lands Department to take a look at how the equipment and the facilities look like. We took some photographs, and, and we got to a, a man who said that, oh, he was the registry. And he said, well, so what do you do? And this man, he had a, a typewriter. And, you know, a, a, a typewriter, no, no, no computer, a typewriter. This is 2005. A typewriter, and it was not even like the IBM Selectric typewriter of that type. This is one of those old ones, the ones that, you know, you go there and, you know, they type, and then they move the thing this way, and you hear, kang, something, and it's the old type. This man, that's what he was using. He said he was a registry. Said, <laughs> and then you go there, they'll show you some maps. You, you go through some of the maps are torn. So that if you're looking for some, some plot or somewhere, and it is where the map is torn, it means you won't find it. Uh, so we knew, we knew that ICT technology had to be brought into government. If you don't bring technology in it, you go to a bank, you go to Unilever, you go to private sector organizations, they are into technology. The public sector too must come into technology. So all of those things were supposed to be done. And then productivity, productivity, increase in revenue was to come so that we can get the money, enough money to pay government's workers. And where we had too many workers, then we ought to reduce it to those that were needed so you can pay them well. Now, if you put all those things aside and you just decide to give increases in pay to whoever is sitting there, ah, well, then you will spend the majority of government revenue on paying people who may not necessarily be producing and doing what is it that we require. So for someone who was asking, <laughs> are we implementing the program that was intended? Absolutely not. The pay reform program has been put aside somewhere and it is not being implemented, not according to what we put in place, which is still there. And indeed, some of the people we trained and we work with, they are still there in the secretariat, but they need leadership and they also need support from government and they need an institution backing them to make sure that the, that the reform program works well, and that we place everything into that context. And, and so um, what I'm here, I'm holding in my hand is indeed the report that started single spine. 
this report. Um, I'm not showing this report because it has the name of the consulting company there. And I don't want to bring that consulting company's name in here. But what it says here is a development of a comprehensive